And thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for choosing us. And hopefully you just at home in your comfort zone and thank you for using your Wi-Fi on us. My name is Bujivika and today we bring you nothing but the best when it comes to intellectual property, discussing all things entertainment industry, especially if you're young and you know that you're on social media and you also know how you interact with people. Today we're saying don't lose sight of your intellectual property. Don't forget that you're still a human being. And most of all, that entertainment requires a lot of your soul. And then with that being said and done, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to hand over to the one and only Elroy. <laughs> Hello and welcome. This is the Intellectual Property Virtual Education Workshop uh, brought to you by the Gauteng Province Sports, Arts, Culture and Recreation and Sinotondo Arts Management. Um, my name is Elroy Bell. I am from the Dramatic, Artistic, and Literary Rights Organization, which is Delro. I run the theater and visual arts licensing department there, and I'll be facilitating our discussion today. Um, I'm with Simon Brenders and Ayanna Langotti, right? Yes. Um, so today, um, we are filming under COVID-19 protocols, so we welcome you from whichever screen you're watching us online. Um, and our discussion today, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, is around intellectual property <coughs> rights um, and how they affect the creative and cultural industries. But first, I'd like to introduce our, our guests. I'd like to ask them to just give a short introduction about who they are and, and what <coughs> brings them to this discussion. Hi, thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. My name is Ayanda <coughs> Tangoti. I am a 38-year-old artist. I've been in the arts since I was uh, like 11 years old. Um, I've, I've done the voice of Little Simba when I was 12. Um, they couldn't find a, a, a boy voice they could sing, so I had a boy's voice and I was a girl, so I was very proud of that when I did Lion, Lion King in Zulu. Um, the voice for Little Simba. And um, I think my biggest highlight has been <coughs> the reality show Idols that started in 2002. Up until today, people still remember that first season. And this is what really got me more deep, deep, deep into the, the industry. Um, but I come from a very musical family um, um, with many legends, do not where to name a few. And my mother was uh, uh, in, in Mango Groove for many years, and she she'd been writing songs with um, her friend in LA uh, for movies and film and all of that. So I come here as the third or fourth generation of that kind of background, trying to just hopefully be more educated. Um, in terms of everything around the industry so that to, to change things a little bit. So that's who I am, but I sing professionally um, on stage, behind stage, but I also love, I have a deep, deep, deep passion for teaching um, arts and teaching young people youth. So I come here also as a representative of the youth that want to come into the arts. Good day, everybody. I'm Simon Brandes. When Ayanda was one year old, I <laughs> auditioned for a film. <laughs> uh, and uh, that was like 37 years ago. Uh, it was called Brew Marty. I, and I became, after Ken Gampu, the first uh, uh, black actor to play a lead in a film that was on the Sterkiniko circuit. And after that, there was 22 TV series and a few other films. I am... Um, but I, I also love writing plays. I uh, was asked by a school in, a, in Ocean View to write a, a, a play for them, for the school. And then there was also a private school in Midran. And then I would go there and I would look at the issues that they, <laughs> they handle and then uh, do the play. I also did over uh, 12 years, we did industrial theatre where I wrote plays on... Uh, on, on safety, mostly occupational health and safety for mining companies and so on. So, so I'm a safety fundi. I was looking at your, your COVID stuff and I say, no, okay, you passed the test. <laughs> 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 and uh, um, yeah, I love, I love uh, um, acting, obviously. And then sometimes you, you sit with a situation that 
there is a story that you would like to tell, but nobody's writing the story. <laughs> then the challenge is do it yourself. Uh, out of my one of my plays called uh, Decide Board and Fear, I wrote it. I worked it into a novel. At the end of the day, it was published as the sideboard, then it was uh, translated into English and Dutch. And then uh, I did a musical on it. I, I adapted it to a musical that was performed. It was hectic when it came to the money side of it because the, the <laughs> cast was 16 people. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it went well. And then um, I wrote a second book, um, a youth novel uh, uh, that I would hopefully referred to later, which I translated during COVID. I had the time <laughs> to translate it into English. And yeah, but I was always uh, interested in, in the rights because when you sit there, you, you always sit with the question, what can I do and what am I not allowed to do? I mean, hopefully we'll touch on a lot of those points as well. Um, I think just because we're having this discussion around intellectual property, I think it's wise to also just touch on why intellectual property. So I thought I'd just have a, a little brief um, outline of why we see the value in intellectual property, um, if you don't mind, uh, and yeah. then we'll just jump straight into discussions, I think. Um, so intellectual property, or IP, is d generally divided into two main realms, which is industrial property rights, which would include your trademarks, your patents, your designs, um, which are uh, which generally we wouldn't be covering today because yeah. it's outside of our general wheelhouse. But then the other side of intellectual property is your copyright protection. So that generally covers your um, visual art, um, artwork, your literary work, architecture as well, um, writing, uh, uh, musical compose compositions, all of those sorts of artistic and literary works are covered under that copyright um, aspect of intellectual property. And what IP does is it, it makes cultural heritage and knowledge available to the public through a, a very safe and clear legal framework generally. And the licensing that generates from that sort of framework, it, the licensing that is to say the permission to use any of those sorts of works, generates a royalty income for authors, artists, and creators um, off of their existing work, which allows them the freedom to create new work. Um, and also just generate uh, an income from the existing work, um, which uh, it, it's economically just needed within our industry mm -hmm. um, to have artists in control of all revenue streams available to them. So I think that just touches briefly on, on the idea of intellectual property. Obviously, there's cultural value to IP as well as economic value. But I think before we get into um, a further discussion around that, I wanted to just talk to both of you around um, what are you hoping to draw from this conversation in terms of copyright um, from your own experiences? I think that's important, especially for the viewers um, who may be coming into this discussion with no knowledge around copyright, um, who have particular negative experiences with, with people managing copyright on their behalf as well. So just from the two of you, what is your experiences around um, copyright? Um, well, I, uh, my experience has been that of an artist who is in and out, in and out, in and out, you know, always not informed well enough to be able to, to run with it so that it can benefit me um, fully. Um, so the experience that I've experienced with it really, and I hope that after the discussion today, um, as I represent the others out there who also are not I, I, in my position where they're still trying to inform themselves. I hope to walk out more motivated because the in and out experience that I've been experiencing is, uh, as artists, we are generally always just invited in, in platforms where we are being, you know, given an opportunity to be well informed, but um, that discussion never really, I never really experienced any time when I came out of that discussion having been more motivated or uh, feeling like uh, I've, I've, I've learned a lot from it because there's a lot of unfinished business from back, back, back in the day, even before I was born. So I find with my experience, unfortunately, I've experienced the bridge between the, um, the ones that come before us and us who are, who are just coming in. I've, 
I've experienced a lot of fear in going into that discussion because I find that if, if our great-grandparents, our grandparents and our, and our parents uh, are still filled with this rage in them, you know, of, 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 of just counting all the, the, the years and the hours, the blood, sweat and tears, but at the end of the day, they still like trying, you know? So I've come up with, unfortunately, that's the experience that I've had is a, a fear-based experience where I feel like, do I really need to go into this or can I just have something um, that I focus on as well in my life outside of this, yeah. <laughs> this, 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 this kind of, for lack of a better word, this mess that I'm, I'm experiencing, just to keep myself busy and not be too attached to wanting to get things right. Um, and in time, things will flow in place. So the experience that I've had, unfortunately, was that, which then led me to engage in a lot of um, huge projects where I think to myself, okay, I guess, let me just sign, you know? Let me just sign, you know? This is the same contract that the legend that I'm looking up to signed, so who am I? So that's the unfortunate experience that I've had. So after today's discussion, I hope that you understand the importance of, of why you need to understand intellectual property. And you, you know, it's, it's a huge thing, it's a big deal. And as an artist, there's that imbalance. You know, you're a creative being, and to, when you're creative, you open yourself emotionally. And then you get to a position where now you have to kind of wear a different hat. So fortunately, we do have people in place that can represent you um, so that you don't have to go into all of that. But um, recently I've had an experience where I decided that since I have a daughter and a son that is already in that industry, they're just little, you know, and they, they're creating waves. And I thought, okay, Ayanda, let's do things differently. When they come forward, you know, keep the excitement going. Okay, wow, I'm keen, I'm excited. Wow, I really want to be part of this. Let me pass this on to my legal advisor. Usually that's like, as soon as I, as I say that with the past three projects that I've lost, things don't usually move as fast as they usually do. And you end up losing a deal. Unfortunately, at this day and time, there are still people who work, work with artists in that way. So that's the experience that I'm coming with. And I hope to walk out here motivated to just dive in you know, because now I've got kids who chose the same path. I mm. think there's, a, there's a, a hope here as well that we actually move forward through motivating you, like you and everyone else watching, as well as break any sort of those fear um, associations to this. Uh, hopefully we'll have that sort of opportunity and, and during the discussion to discuss artists as, uh, as companies, artists as businesses, and intellectual property and the, cre the creative assets that people are creating as the financial assets as well and how that can be better managed by both the, the producing companies and, and organizations that are employing artists and creators as well as the, uh, the artists and creators' ability to protect their own rights as well. So hopefully we can get through a little bit of that. Simon? Yeah, my first experience with, uh, as an actor was um, with this film that I made. Uh, we signed, you know, I was then paid, that was long years ago, I was paid 120 rand a call. <laughs> and I thought that was good money. Anyway, then the, uh, so the, the film was made by Satpal. They owned the film. But eventually they sold the film to the, the public broadcaster. And later on, that film was sold to an Afrikaans channel which showed it probably 40 times. I, I, I would uh, uh, be at home or on my phone would ring and I'd say, hey, I'm watching you again playing in Brumati. And I never got a cent for that. I'm still now, the 120, the rand is, <laughs> if we put all of the stuff together that I filmed, <laughs> it would probably be a call today. And uh, so that, that's the one thing. I think in initially now it is probably better, but I think as, as actors, uh, uh, one should look out for that kind. What stands in your contract? It is, I know the SABC had a contract if it is uh, broadcast after the second time, then you get royalties, but certain actors only. 
I got that in Mollefish when they rebroadcast Mollefish. I got a, a check, and uh, but but other parts are also important and they are not covered, uh, and one must make sure of that kind of thing. If you you write, um, say you want to write your play, there are so much information around us. There are so many movies. Uh, there are so many other things, clips and stuff. And you might find yourself in a situation where my story is very close to your story. Can I go on? So at, at later on, I would like to talk about the idea versus the, you know, the, the thing that can, <laughs> can an idea be copyrighted? So, so that is a guidance that people need. What if I want to use Lyra song? Because in my book, or in my play, Lira song could work if I play it or I get one of my own artists to sing it because is, there's that moment for inside so strong, you know, and, and, and can you use it and, and how do the younger people use it without falling into a situation where you got a, 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 you get an, an, an some into some big trouble. And if we can think of Whitney, uh, that big song from The Bodyguard, she, um, uh, uh, what's her name now, Dolly Parton, made millions out of that, but that was an agreement. Whitney wanted to use the song, and the song became pr one of the biggest songs ever. So, so they are, but on a local level, we also sit with good music that works in a play. I love y to use a song because a song can tell you a lot more than the actor could do. If it comes in, it just brings a different mood. But what is the pitfalls and what is not? I think that's a very good point to start, I think. I, I think if we, let's just take a step back because I think we've, we've jumped right into our experiences and, and <laughs> I think historical sort of uh, um, ideas of what this is personally, I think as well. But if we just bring it back to the idea of what is copyright? So, I mean, do you guys want to um, maybe jump in and, and offer some sort of um, experience around what copyright m might be for you guys? Yeah, from what I've experienced, um, copyright uh, is, is the contract that I shouldn't sign that everybody <laughs> told me <laughs> not to do. <laughs> They're like, as if you see that word copyright, you need to just slow down. Okay, so, mm. slow okay. Down. Um, and then um, from from what then I I I I picked up on the way it's it really is, it's like the right for the use of the work that you've created, um, which has been quite very tricky because if if, uh, if unfortunately I have to go back to the experience if you don't give away the right the copyright then your work is not really used anyway, and if you're an artist you want to to extent to to have a history of what you've done and offered in this in this industry of arts so copyright is really just the right of the work that has been created and the you the, the give the, the right on where to use it when how um, that's what I understand about it so I mean that's completely right I mm. mean what what essentially it is from a legal standpoint is copyright represents the bundle of rights related to a particular work that has been created. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we'll get into the idea of what can and how copyright is registered in inverted commas, but this in, it incl copyright includes the, uh, the ability and the ability to pass that right on to somebody else to copy, to reproduce the work in any sort of form, to adapt the work, to translate it, to be able to convert a book into a film, all of those sorts of um, abilities are vested within copyright, the copyright yep. bundle. Um, so essentially, if you're talking about the idea to license, um, so the idea, I, I'm throwing out jargon here, um, but I'm also explaining it. So <laughs> the idea is, uh, of, of a license is just permission. License is only means to give someone permission. And that license can be exclusive or non-exclusive. So if you give somebody an exclusive um, license, it gives them and only them the right to do whatever they want with that work, dependent on whatever the license contract means. A non-exclusive right gives somebody the ability to do 
um, to, for example, put it on an advertisement billboard and allow someone else to do whatever they want to do with that um, image um, for that example. Uh, so, for example, with, with regards to the music um, example that, that, that Simon brought mm. up around the, 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 the Dolly Parton song, I can't remember the name of it for the life of me. Everyone's I'm going trying to, to remember now. Uh, Always uh, love you. Uh, I will always, I will love, always you. love you. So Dolly Parton wrote it and licensed it to Whitney to, to Whitney re, re, re record. And I think there's a lot of conversations around how can I maybe use the song in, in my film or in whatever sort of um, use I want to. And there are various organizations that currently exist within South Africa that allow us to, to do that. I, Samro, Capasso, and Sampra are all music organizations um, which allow. Um, for the various parts of a song to be licensed in whatever way that people would like to use it for whatever purpose. So, mm. I mean, just to answer that sort of experience that you, that you brought up, Simon, um, in relation to, to the idea of copyright. Um, so, so the license is basically the permission. So what we're talking about in terms <laughs> of seeding rights. So this is when you give your rights to somebody else, which, you, which Ayanda was talking about. Um, as somebody that works within copyright, I don't recommend that unless you've, you're making a lot of money from the work. Um, unless the, the amount of money that you're being paid for to give all those rights away is equal to or more than any royalty income you could obtain from, using that, from owning that work. I think the important thing that we need to remember as creatives and people that work in the industry is that we need to understand what terms and conditions of a contract are. <laughs> and I think I was talking to Ayanda about this earlier. I think we're, mm. as creatives in this industry, we're already at such a disadvantage yeah. because we're not taught how to read contracts or how to manage contracts. We learn on the job. We learn on the job, um, but also if you've, uh, if you've gone into a school, you, you, they, teach, they teach you um, all of this a, a, at a school. Um, but it's, it's very tricky because it's, you are, you are, you are passion-driven, you know, before you decide to be an artist. It's the passion that drives you. It's not really the legalities. So once you go in, you're in, and then you're trying to now change things. So that's the, that's the tough balance that we find that just to change that hat. The, the switching of the hat. So to have um, institutions like Samro and, and all of that is is really us just saying, oh, thank goodness we have somebody who can represent us that we just have to be members of. But we find that even if we're members of Samro, we still need to be informed. Yeah. And it's it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's just crazy. It's a it's conflict, you know, that can easily arise, and I think it did in the past to some extent, is between comedians. You know, comedians. It is such a fine line, and that is what I said with all the jargon and all the movies and all the clips around us. Because uh, comedians here would like, they, they like to make fun of the present. Yeah. And there is only this happening. I mean, Mark Lottron talks about weddings. If I do a comedy, can I also refer to what happened at my weddings? It's, mm. it's that, that kind of stuff. When are you overstepping? And somebody might feel that you are... Uh, overstepping because I use that line in my comedy and now you come on, on stage, so it is, it's, it's difficult. It is. I, I think, I, think we, I mean, I'm glad that organizations like my own, I mean, I, I don't want to punt my own <laughs> organization, but I do work for uh, the Dramatic Artistic and Literary Rights Organization, as I mentioned earlier, and we deal in copyright issues and licensing issues related to theater, dramatic texts, visual art, um, novels and, and publishing rights, etc. And even the course <laughs> readers in the university um, packs that people get, we also manage those sorts of rights. A and I think we, we're very glad to be able to offer that sort of service where mm. somebody is, is not sure of the law, somebody wants to use something like that, and they're not sure if they're overstepping the mark, um, if they're allowed to or not. And luckily, we know the Copyright Act as it stands, and, and I'm able to have those conversations with people around, okay, so there is provision for an exception around satire in the, in the, in the Act, and it allows you to, to bring this up or critique a particular visual artwork in a book, or all of those sorts of things. So I think it's understanding what those um, clear exceptions are um, that allow people to use those things without necessarily asking for the permission or the license, um, and then understanding that there are very clear moments when you do need to. So I often get the question of like, um, so I've ad adapted or translated this book, and, I, and I, uh, my first question is always, did you ask permission before you did it? 
because <laughs> the idea is, because that's a licensable thing. The idea to adapt or translate a text, um, it requires permission before you even pick a pen to translate the first word. Um, so those are important discussions I have with people, and I'm so glad we're having this conversation, and we are always available. I'll inevitably leave our contact details in the comment section underneath wherever this video is posted, just so that people have an, uh, an opportunity to engage with people that know more, so that you don't end up in that situation of fear around how you're going to manage this. Yeah, and especially as you're talking um, about permission. Um, the permission is... is once you see, I don't know how the system can improve in terms of once you identify that your work is being used and yet you did not get permission, I think the other line besides the fear of, of going into and being more informed is, is the, the exhaustion behind it to say now you've identified, okay, now what are you going to do about it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's yeah. step one? What yeah. you don't do about it. They do, it's like, oh, you know what? And I'm I, just yeah. an artist. <laughs> and I think that's a really, th I mean, I, I find it very frustrating when it artists is, say that. Because it happens. I mean, I know some artists who are doing very well and who have good managers and they've signed the contract, but it doesn't stop people from using their work without their permission. So now what, what then? Yeah, so I think that's a, I think like we can actually have a, a brief discussion on that. So when somebody uses a work against someone's permission, it's called yeah. an infringement. Um, so you, you, you're infringing on that, that person's copyright protection. <laughs> so I think we, 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 there's a particular way that I try and manage it without involving the magistrates and the lawyers. Yes. Um, so I, I, do, I do try and attempt, if, if one of my represented artists or authors, if their work is used without permission or their copyright is infringed, I will first attempt to engage with whomever is using that work and come to an amicable sort of resolution where um, they understand that this is... Because a lot of our infringements I've found in this country are a result of ignorance or naivety, um, which is very disappointing because and again if you're not sure ask someone um yeah so yeah then we try and resolve it amicably and then uh, generate some sort of royalty income from that use that was done illegally um but i'd be interested to know from your experiences around infringements around your own work um or things that you've heard um uh, would, is there anything that you'd like to bring to the discussion yeah i came uh, on my first book which was translated a handful of earth the sideboard i i was going into litnet and i came across an article um where uh, uh, somebody wrote a mini thesis uh, referring to my book all the time and and then i started inquiring was this was this uh, okay because she it was really a, a, i loved how she used what I wrote in the book in terms of man's relationship to plants uh, in, the, in, in, in this thing. And then I was said, no, it was used for educational purpose. And a month ago, I always had, a, also had a, a request that for somebody that needed to, to, to use something from my book. And, and that, was, that was the thing. So there was even in the form they sent me a fee, you know, a paragraph that says fee. Mm -hmm. So I suggested a fee there. <laughs> and they said, no, unfortunately, they can't uh, pay fee. But that's basically the only, the only way uh, that I've been f felt, listen, somebody is moving. I'm not, I'm not that well published. And, uh, but what I come across with young, uh, because I, I, I speak to younger people, uh, a lot is the, is the question of the idea, you know. People, and I think one uh, should tell the people out there from the start that ideas are, can't be copyrighted. You know, if a hunk of a guy like you now walks down the street and there is three women walking on the other side and they look at this guy, two of them might have the same idea. <laughs> but it only, it depends on who of them is actually getting to guy, the guy to wine and dine them. So <laughs> the idea is, is, is other people have the same idea. There are, there are lots of ideas. And, and, and you, you, so you cannot say, but I had the same idea. People would say, uh, listen, I sat in a pub 
or in a, in a restaurant, obviously between uh, Monday and Thursday, and you know that kind of stuff, and using uh, uh, you know adhering to the social distancing. And I had this idea, and two months later I saw my idea in a play. You've got no recourse because you the law says until you have written something down or actually performed it, you can be done. Now, in, uh, uh, what I did with one of my first plays, uh, I was advised, uh, uh, because at that time we didn't have all the structures and it was years ago, and I was advised by somebody, listen, you now have the play. The play is not complete, but it is, it is there. Then you, you, what you do, and you can say whether it is still uh, 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 the way to go, uh, what I was advised to do is to put the play, uh, 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 type it out in hard copy in and mail it to me, <laughs> seal the envelope, address it to me with a date on, and then when it arrives at my, my, my house in the mail, I mustn't open it. I must keep it just like that. So if something happens, then I can say, okay, I mailed this to myself in 2015 already. Where did you come with this script in 2019? So, so those are the kind of, of things that cost nothing to sort of secure that your work are not, are not used in a different way. Oh, man. Simon, you're exactly <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> uh, when we run discussions oh. like this, we have often refer to that as the old school copyright yeah. registration yeah. method, which yeah. is still used by it some people. We still recommend it because it's easy, it's cheap. Um, it doesn't require any sort of engagement with a, an officer of the court. So, so the idea of, of can these things be registered? Um, so copyright, can, uh, copyright is automatically vested in a work the moment it's in its physical form. So whether you're talking about visual artworks, whether you're talking about a poem or a play or a book, the moment you have the manuscript written down, mm. the moment you have the artistic work in physical form, it's copyright protected because it's an original work that you've invested time and energy into. Um, so the idea, however, around infringements is that the law relies on the onus of the original owner to prove originality if that there is, is right. an infringement. Yeah. So while you hope that you're never in a situation where somebody's stealing your work, you have to prepare for the worst as a creative. So what we recommend a lot of the time is for, um, for people to either do this old school copyright method of, of sending the, the, the manuscript through the post and not opening it um, with a post. So it has to be registered post so that you have yes, the date stamp that on is it. Right. And then if there's an infringement, the magistrate will open that in court with the date stamp and have it be um, opening the seal. You can also you can leave your manuscript or any sort of a, a creative work that you've created with a legal officer of the court, so a lawyer who can then sign a document indicating that it was received that date, um, a bank deposit. All of these things cost money, however. So, it's, and also you can also um, email it to yourself. I suppose mm. they, you can have a date stamp on the emails, and you save various drafts which have metadata in it related to the date and time when the work was created. For visual artists, I recommend taking, um, documenting the process. So taking images of the creative, the creative process, um, which is also photographs with metadata uh, with, date, with date stamped in it. So there are ways around um, sort of safeguarding the work in some ways. But it's sad that we have to, isn't it? But I, I suppose that's just the nature of, 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 of what we do. We just have to prepare for the worst in case it happens. Um, yeah. And like Simon says, you, you can't really protect an idea because no one knows that the idea is yours. It's just wafting mm. around there in the gray matter until you write it down. Um, and the same yeah. thing with trademarks and patents as well. For example, the, 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 they advise you not to discuss or bring to a public forum the idea for a trademark until it is awarded to you. Um, so even within the, 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 the industrial um, in, um, property rights uh, around intellectual property, it's best to keep it with you until you have it registered with a body, or with, re with regards to copyright where there is no re registration body, just make sure that you are documenting your process. And Yeah, and the other thing I would like uh, for the viewers, especially the younger ones or the newer ones, to, uh, to see the difference between the idea and a theme. The, the theme of lost love, or un, uh, you know, forbidden love, that kind of thing. It's, it's a theme that's mm. been used all over since Sophocles. Yeah. <laughs> and and, the, and, and you, you can still use it. So that is a theme. I, I had a situation where I, for this 
at school that I wrote, I, I saw, I watched the movie, Step Up, the first one, and I said, that is, that is the idea, that is the thing that I would, I would love to, because I loved the theme of the story, the fact that these people in the township can go there and they can find a way and suddenly become stars. And, and, and so I, I wrote, the, but I didn't write a step up. I wrote my own story, but it inspired me, the theme of, of a step up, because our children don't live in Baltimore or, you know, Brooklyn. They, they you do different things on the Cape Flats and they don't dance in the street, but they, it's talented people who can use their talent to overcome certain things. And then also there you have the rich, the guy that is more privileged than the other one. And it so often happens that the less privileged person is more talented. And <laughs> you bring that into the play, you can still succeed and be a star on the night when you actually win the competition. And, but it is a theme. You are not stealing a theme. You are, the, the, the theme works love stories, whatever it is, it, it works, sportman, progressing, it's been used in various movies and films and books and plays and stuff. So the, the idea and the theme is, is different things. If you say, I want to make a Generations the legacy, that's not on. But <laughs> in your story, there might be elements of the theme that is going there. And mm. one should then feel happy to go and work on that theme. Hmm. And it all, I, I guess you made an, an example of Generations, the legacy. I guess it, it, can we say that it also depends on how, I mean, Generations, the legacy is showing every day, and then you might have had an idea of the legacy, but now that it's on TV all the time, it's like, maybe don't do that. Is that what you mean? Like, because I mean, already. I think, I think. <laughs> I think what, what Simon is also saying as well, and related to this idea, Ayanda, is that if we're inspired by something, it doesn't mean that it's infringing on copyright unless you're taking word for word the script or you're, you're following exactly that plot. Mm. But we can often be inspired by things to create new things. I think the idea is very much that as long as the work is original in some form, yeah. um, it is then yours and then independently copyright protected. That's so right. as much as like we have the genera uh, generations, the legacy, and then there's also something else called the legacy now, mm. right? Yeah, so, but they're different shows. Yeah. yeah. They're very different shows. So even if you then go on to go do the, the legacy, say it was the fierce, and uh, not the, mm. the legacy, say it was the, which are also different programs, yeah. but then you put another, like, uh, it's a new show. It's something it's completely different. Because it might the ideas be, are there. Yeah. yeah. It's just, uh, the titles might be similar, but there's, t like, there's only so many words in the dictionary. Mm. There, there will inevitably be some overlap with titles with, I mean, I, I see, constantly I'm seeing, um, performance artists getting sued by other people because their song is using this other person's name or yeah. some, I saw this happen. A in line, US a, a line. They would use a line in a song and they would, I haven't experienced in that sense, but I wouldn't mention it now, <coughs> <laughs> where, where there was just a line in the lyrics of the song. And I said, you can't, who can copyright I love you in a song? It's been used in a million songs. So then, then at the end of the day, when you're looking at sort of cases where people are suing each other over those sorts of perceived infringements, or if mm. it might be very well a clear infringement, then it escalates to a magistrate or a court where they then decide, they, they balance it out and they understand what is the, the, the scope of exposure here or the, or the, or the, the weight of, of this infringement, so to speak. Is it, is it clearly infringement or is it just a common use of the language? Um, so I think then we do lean on, on legal people to interpret the case law and the, and the, and the leg legislative framework that we have in order to make a decision around whether that's an infringement or not. But generally speaking, when you're talking about a song inspiring you to write a poem or a, a, a sort of a, a, a movie that you've watched inspiring you to um, write a play, which is unrelated to that movie but shares the same themes or following in, in the style of, of, of uh, George Pember, for example, in, yeah. in visual art, not necessarily copying a work, but just following the same sort of artistic style as him. I mean, those are, are areas where you're inspired. And I don't, I don't think that most people would see those as copyright infringements. Yeah. And then adaptation is, 
is, is important. That's definitely, I yes. remember uh, years ago, I mean, what Welcome Somi did with Umabata, it was Macbeth, but he couldn't do uh, Umabata without contacting the Shakespeare yes. people. Yeah. <laughs> and, but it was an ap adaptation which worked so well, he baffled British audiences in 1970 with the Zulu Macbeth. So, so those are the things. There you definitely have to talk to the other people. But if you see um, King killing his wife and marrying somebody else, that happens. And, 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 and you, can, you, you don't necessarily have to go there. So I think that brings us to another uh, point that I often get asked a lot of the time. Um, somebody working in this industry is this, if someone is passed on, if, if a particular creative has died, I can then just use their work, can't I? Without asking mm -hmm. permission or paying anybody. Like, I mean, they're dead. So obviously I'm allowed to use their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they usually say uh, 50 years after. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, th so, so, so you're completely right. Uh, there's a, there's what if a it becomes big after 15 year, 50 years? Well, old. that's just <laughs> unfortunate, Maybe isn't in it? the first, in the, <laughs> during those 50 years, it doesn't really do much, you know. And then after 50 years, then somebody picks it up and then you, you've died like 50, 50 years ago mm. and then your children are not going to benefit financially benefit from, from that. I know, it's, it's, it's quite a shame if that does happen. Um, but it also depends on which country you're in or from <laughs> exactly when, when you do the work. Because in South Africa, I mean, copyright... Ultimately, what we're talking about here is copyright has a lifespan. So the copyright protection in a work lasts for the life of the artist or author that created that work plus 50 years after they've passed on. And if there's more than one artist or author that's created the work, it lasts until the last author or artist passes on and 50 years after they die. So it's useful sometimes to collaborate um, with younger <laughs> people as well. <laughs> yeah. So you know the work's going to have a nice long copyright lifespan. Uh, but, yeah. but the other thing that I think that we uh, must maybe give guidance is to, I have the work now. What do I do to, to where does my royalties go to? And that is that is uh, got to do with my will, do I yeah. create? Uh, yeah. I think that is there's a lot of guidance there. If I now die... And I've got these books, where does this money go to? Completely because my right. bank account will be closed. At, at <laughs> you're, you're completely right, Simon. I mean, at, at the end of the day, in South Africa, and specifically we were talking about South Africa, um, we have a lifetime, a, a lifetime in copyright of up to 50 years. In other countries like the UK and, and, the, and the EU, for example, that's 75 years. Um, it just depends on what the legal framework of that territory is. So with regards to what we call estate planning for artists and creatives, so when you're thinking about, this is the creative assets that I have made. So it's important for us as creatives to also understand that we're creating artistic work, but along with that, we are creating financial assets that have worth and that have economic value that will, that will live long after we have passed on. And we need to understand what happens to that value after we go. So what we also talk about is making sure that you put a very clear clause in your last will and testament when you're doing your estate planning around who owns what percentages. So if you want to split them equally among all your kids or your spouse or any of your siblings, for example, you have an opportunity to clearly indicate who owns what percentage after you've gone. And then any royalties that are... are, are, are um, are, are generated after you've passed on are, this, are then split according to that percentage that is indicated in your will. If there is no will in testament, then your royalties will then enter into what is called intestate. So they'll follow according to who, who has um, survived you. So if you've got your partner or spouse has survived you, then all those royalties will go to them. Or if they will be survived by all of your children, that will be split among all of your kids. So I think it's very important because you understand yourself and you know who of the people that you are surrounded by, the loved ones that you have, who would you want to have this work benefit and who would appreciate it. Um, because at the end of the day, um, it's also important that you have organizations that also know how to manage yeah. this for you. That's so yeah. Dalro also offers this service where we engage with, with particular authors and visual artists and then understand earlier on who your next of kin is, who you would like to be leaving royalties to, and then we engage in that process immediately following on after you've, or, or whoever has passed on. Yeah. So, so then we, we then understand what documents need to be get, yeah. gotten. Um, uh, there's a letter of executorship. You need to get the, um, 
the, uh, the, the death certificate of the particular mm -hmm. rights holder. Mm -hmm. And then you have to understand, OK, then how am I splitting these royalties going forward? And it's always easier to have an external organization mm -hmm. manage this for mm -hmm. you so that it doesn't cause infighting in the family, which is something that we see quite often, unfortunately. Don't miss, and you don't miss things. And, and then they like argue that. about the percentage that this one have 2% more than that one. And it's, it's better if it's written down. It's better yeah, if, it's, if it's the... If it's the with the wishes of this person that they, they, they both, um, or that everybody that knows. So, so I guess I, what we're saying, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, you can go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, what I, yeah, what I um, am doing is I, I am creating a trust, a trust in my name, which, and all my family members and whoever wants to inherit whatever uh, debts I have, <laughs> they, that, will be, uh, that will be determined by the trust. The trust will say, okay, you uh, get so much. And then all that my publisher does or whoever does is just pay it and it goes into the trust and that is sorted out. Then you I think that's a safe bet. I think especially if you've got a number of, of, of people that you would like to benefit from it. Uh, we, trusts are relatively easy to set up. You can find information online. I mean, there's specific South African information about tr setting up trusts. So if you just type in Google, trust South Africa like it's very easy to do and then you have specific people to manage that and then you list the people that you would like to be beneficiaries of that trust and it makes it easier for people that are paying out royalties like organizations like mine or publishers for example yeah. because then you just pay to one organization and then that organization has beneficiaries attached so it's it's a it's a very good way to do it um, trusts um, are very useful for so that. I guess from what you've just um pointed out about organizations, I guess the, the first major thing um, I'm picking up from this discussion as an artist, if you want to go into the arts, whether you want to be a musician, is to understand who those organizations are and then at least make sure that your relationship between yourself as an artist and those organizations, it's, you, 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 make, you make use of it. Yeah. So um, as you were mentioning the organizations, I, I I remembered that there's another very simple, <laughs> simple to do that we're meant to do as artists is to notify our organizations every time we do any work, whether here at home or away or in the record studio. It, it just takes a simple step of just notify them. You know, um, you don't even need to know what you're supposed to do with all of all of the information because they're there, they're informed, they will sit down with you and they'll take you through. But that's another line that we're not, for some weird reason, as artists, we don't have the time to notify our organizations and then it becomes such a hassle yeah. to try to manage, for the organization to even manage all our rights and things like that. So. I would like to inspire artists to, to, to just get into the habit of notifying organizations because where do you start really? Yeah. I mean, if you don't notify them. I think it's important to understand that as much as we're creators, and I mentioned this before and I say it so often, as much as we're creators, whether that be visual artists, sculptors, like authors, um, uh, thespians, I mean, at the end of the day, you are a business. This is how you're making money. This is how you are serving your family. This is how you're generating income for, for those around you. And in the same way that other entrepreneurs, whether that be electricians or plumbers or, uh, or anyone uh, that is doing any sort of work, everybody has organizations that guide them, whether that be a, uh, a, a, the bargaining council or accountants mm -hmm. or any sort of people that entrepreneurs need to rely on. We as artists have organizations that we should look to and sort of research around before before we actually desperately need them, you know? So I think it's, it's, it's preparing before the worst happens, I suppose. I suppose. So, I mean, you, you've got a number of organizations like um, Dalro, I've mentioned, Samro, Sampra, Capasso. You've got the Anfaza, which deals with nonfiction writers of South Africa. Um, you've got, I mean, I'm, uh, there's so many. Um, they, yeah, I, I can't even get to all That's of them. Motion Picture um, Licensing Company. Yeah, you've got the Screenwriters Guild of South Africa as well. Um, so these organizations all have, they occupy different spaces within the industry and they come with their own level of knowledge um, that is able to advise within those industries and those subsections of those industries. 
That's right. And I think it's important then where you make your last will and testament or, or whatever, leave something to your family in the sense that um, these are the organizations that you must contact. Because yeah. Yeah. you might be the only artist in your family and all the other mm -hmm. guys have no clue yeah. ab about all that stuff. So if that is the case, then then leave some guidance for the family after you to say, listen, that's very important. these are the people, these are their contact numbers, they will help you. I think that's very, very important. I think that there's an, another question I also had is like, I often get the question of like, oh, I've bought this play or I've bought this, this artwork. I can just do anything I want with it because I own it. But I think there's, there's, there's also a very clear distinction that needs to be made for the audience as well between physical property and intellectual property. So if I, for example, own a Sam Klingetwa painting in my dining room, just because I own the physical artwork doesn't mean I own the intellectual property in that artwork. So I can't suddenly take photographs of that painting in my dining room mm. and publish books with the, in, uh, with, the, with the image on it because I don't necessarily own the intellectual property in that artwork. In the same way that if I buy a play script, it doesn't automatically give me the right to perform it in whatever way I want to. Uh, that's a different right. Mm. So Even I, a DVD. You or can't a DVD. buy a DVD and go sing it. <laughs> or buy a DVD. I mean, I, I, DVDs, I haven't thought of a DVD. I don't even have a DVD drive in my laptop anymore. But I understand exactly well, what well. you mean, Simon. I think <laughs> if you buy a DVD and you want to then broadcast it or, or pre present it to a whole group of people, am I allowed to do that? Isn't oh, this man. just for private screening? So it's those understanding of like the difference between mm. a physical property and buying something and then understanding what I'm allowed to do with that thing. What am I allowed to do with that thing? That's a big question because mm. there's a lot that um, venues are doing with music and they're not even allowed to, you know. Um, it's, it's huge. And I learned at, at, at a stage that the venues need to be licensed yep. and pay a fee yep. to be able to play that music you know DJs need to be licensed you know as well. um and i was like oh gosh really is that what's supposed to happen here we're yeah. just sitting and dining in a in a venue and you know the songs one the playlist is just going yeah. and we, we don't even ask it do, do you have the right to play this let's just find that out but you know the other um, nice thing about it if you do a play and you and you in a theater that is licensed then they would you if you contact them they would normally say, listen, if your play ends with a song, we are licensed to play it in the, in the thing. Mm. So you, you, don't, you don't necessarily have to, yeah. to go and, and re-license mm. the thing or, mm. or whatever. Mm. And sometimes uh, um, what happened to me years ago when I was still an amateur actor, um, I wanted to do, uh, I was in, um, asked our group to enroll for a festival, a drama festival that was run on a regional basis and then national. And I wanted to win these things and I wanted to use the island. And so I phoned Ethel Fugard and he told me that he don't own all the rights. He wrote the play with Dr. John Carney and, and Winston Shona. So I had to phone all three of them and, and get the permission to, to, play, to, to do the play. So sometimes it's not such in, unless they come together and they say you go to Dalro, yeah. then it's fine. Uh, otherwise, you must contact all the people along the line who, 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 who actually worked on that particular piece of, of art and then get all their permissions. So can we say that this education is not only education for the artists, but also the the people who use the Oh, the most work. definitely. Because, I mean, it's not everybody who's like Ubaba who will say, I'd like to use this, but let me just make sure that I have permission. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think this, this, scope, this discussion is important for not only creatives, but it's for rights users as well. I think that's and really important. And, and even sorry. for schools that, that want to do a certain play, they, they must know certain yeah. stuff. If you suddenly, you've never done a play, you played soccer and you played netball, and suddenly you have a teacher. This happened at this school that I talked about. For the first time, they, they never done a play before. It, my play became their first play ever. So now suddenly there is a teacher who wants you to do a play. And the school must then know what do they do before they can do that play. <laughs> Brings back the dignity yeah. of the creative industry. Does. And I think 
I, I mean, just as a reference on that example, I mean, the island you can now license through us in mm. one place. Yeah. You don't have to go to all the different. So Firetown, which have like 13 different rights holders, you just need to come to one organization. <laughs> um, but uh, the other thing that I wanted to say was, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's so important to understand as a rights user how these things work. Um, because you don't want to end up in pitfalls where you're putting yourself at risk as an organization, um, unbeknownst to you. Um, yeah. So at the end Usually of the day... Usually they don't feel like they're putting themselves yeah. to r at risk, you know. Yeah. I mean, I've had one rights user, and I won't mention their name, but it's a restaurant who, who actually said directly to me that the problem that they have with artists is they don't make any profit from them. I, I don't really know how to respond <laughs> to that. <laughs> but, but it's like, it's the music that draws. Yes, exactly. You know, exactly. It, draws, it draws the people to come. Exactly. Come, mm. and it's the feel, the dining feel. And I That's thought... Right. And some music makes you drink a little bit more. Yeah. You it know. makes you drink <laughs> a little bit more, you know? And you're like, Safety. DJ, selector, <laughs> Mr. Selector, keep going, you know? So for the venue to say something like that. So I guess f with the talk that we're having today, um, it, it really just boosts that motivation yeah. to say, no, you're right. And, and if, you, if you don't want to get into the rights, know the organizations. Yeah and make use of them. I think that point of motivation is a really good thing to just tie us back. I mean, just ending off this conversation, how do each of you feel around from c after coming into it with particular <laughs> sort of fears or, or uh, pitfalls around things that have happened in the past? Um, where are you, how do you feel now? Is there anything else that you'd like to ventilate now while, we, while we're still together? <laughs> ventilate, what a word. No, all from <laughs> my side, I would just um, <laughs> encourage people not to let the rules and everything else stop you. Let's find out what are the rules, what am I allowed to do, but let us not stop mm. being creative. Because situations live open, I would never have been able to write a COVID play two years ago, <laughs> but it happened. Now everybody can write a play. So experiences keep on uh, evolving. And, and, and let the young people bring out their work there. Uh, let, there are ways to get around whatever obstacles there are. The main thing is we can create more. That's, that's amazing. And I would like to encourage everyone out there to uh, make it part of your life. Uh, it, it doesn't matter that you don't know everything, but it does matter that, that, it does matter that you're doing something about it. Um, and what I'm coming out of right now is just to at least have that relationship with organizations that um, you need to have a relationship with, depending on what, what uh, arts field you are in, and make use of them. You know, um, also, um, also to encourage you that when you do start the conversation between yourself as an artist and the organizations, um, try to stay far, see a far away from the past and try to just be focused and not be emotionally engaged because there's a lot of unfinished businesses already in the industry. So just try to say you're building a, a checklist for yourself as an artist and keep going just like Ubaba has mentioned, no matter what happens, no matter what you bump into, just do the work and don't stop. Just be creative, but also be responsible with your checklist and stay keep the communication open with all the organizations and the dignity will be restored. I think that's a, be that's a really good sentiment to end it on is do the work, be creative, but be responsible. I think that's the best way to approach it. Um, I, I think, as I mentioned before, I'd like to leave our contact details for anyone um, that needs more information, specifically around Dalro, for example, around um, visual art and theater. Um, around how to protect and how to use copyright protected work. Um, those details will be in the, in the section below the, the video. I'd like to thank Simon and Ayanda very much for joining me today and have a good day. We hope you've had a lot of learnings from today's discussion. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm.